This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 92, Shelley Ebony Ward, part two. Last week, I told you the first part of the story of seven-year-old Shelley Ward, who was found dead in her family's home in Hawksnest, New South Wales, Australia, on November 3rd, 2007 emaciated, lying on a bare mattress in a filthy room filled with human waste. Shelley, who was autistic and had never attended school, spent her final months imprisoned in her dark, filthy bedroom. She is largely known across Australia by her middle name, Ebony, the girl who suffered the country's worst child neglect death. In this episode, I will tell you the rest of Shelley's story, including the arrest and trial of her parents, and the results of multiple investigations into the catastrophic systemic failure of multiple government agencies responsible for protecting Australia's most vulnerable children. This is part two of the tragic story of Shelley Ebony Ward. I'd like to take a moment to give shout-outs to my newest patrons, Ashton N. from San Diego, California, Cassie T. from Wayne, Michigan, and Madison B. from Savannah, Georgia. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash stlcpod, and thank you again. If you haven't yet listened to part one of Shelley's story, I definitely recommend you go back and listen to episode 91 before proceeding with this one, but here's a quick recap before I get into part two. Shelley's family was well known to the Department of Community Services, or DOCS, even before she was born in March of 2000, the third child of parents Blakely and Sharon Ward. The couple's fourth child was permanently removed from their custody as an infant. Shelley and her two older sisters were not removed from Blake and Sharon's custody, despite dozens of reports to DOCS by various individuals and agencies, and despite the couple's obvious drug dependency issues. Ultimately, on November 3, 2007, Shelley was found dead on a bare mattress in her bedroom, which was strewn with human feces. The little girl was severely emaciated and had clearly starved to death. Her case blew the lid off the inefficient, ineffective child welfare system in New South Wales, leading to investigations into how it was possible for a perfectly healthy, if developmentally delayed, little girl to waste away to a skin-covered skeleton despite being on the radar of multiple agencies tasked with protecting her. I'll pick up this week with the results of Shelley's autopsy. Quick warning before I read the results of Shelley's autopsy. The following information will be very graphic and may be disturbing for some. An autopsy was conducted on Shelley's tiny body, which weighed a mere 9 kilograms or just under 20 pounds. A 7-year-old girl should weigh somewhere around 50 to 60 pounds. She was only 106 centimeters or about 3.5 feet tall, while the height of a girl Shelley's age should be around 4 feet. Forensic pathologist Dr. Kassanathan Nadison immediately deduced that Shelley's death was caused by starvation and thirst. Hers, he later said, was the most extreme case he'd ever witnessed. Dr. Nadison said he saw a little child dead, obviously, in an extreme degree of emaciation and wasted and dehydrated. It looked almost like a mummy to me. Shelley's beautiful red hair was long, dirty, and heavily matted with dirt and fecal matter with various other solid particles trapped in it. When her body was examined, many terrible truths came to light. Shelley wore three pairs of socks, clean ones over dirty ones, which she had worn so long that when the last pair was removed, her skin came with them. She was so emaciated that she didn't have enough muscle left for rigor mortis to occur, and the moisture in her body was so low that lividity, or fluid settling at the lowest points of the body, also did not take place. 
Her abdomen was described as scaphoid, which meant it had sort of gone inside. That's usually a common finding in people who have been malnourished, emaciated, and wasted, and also it gave a bluish-green discoloration, indicating that decomposition had set in. There was no food in Shelley's stomach or intestines, and no urine in her bladder. The black vomit Sharon had reported was composed of dried blood and stomach acid, although there was no evidence of bull ants in or around Shelley's mouth as Sharon had mentioned. Shelley suffered from rickets, a bone disease that caused her limbs to become malformed due to lack of vitamin D found in sunlight. The doctor also found evidence of atrophy of the brain and some of Shelley's internal organs, which indicated chronic or long-term malnourishment. Her lungs were quite pink and in a state that suggested someone who was rarely, if ever, taken outside and exposed to the environment. In her large intestine, there was a very hard piece of fecal matter, which is common in people who have not taken any kind of nutrition over a period of time. Although the pathologist washed Shelley's body after the autopsy was complete, they were unable to eradicate the smell of urine and feces that seemed to have permeated her every pore. In the doctor's opinion, he found it highly unlikely that Shelley could have gotten out of bed or moved without assistance in the weeks leading up to her death. Maybe a couple weeks. I cannot comment to that extreme, but within the preceding few days, she would have been in a stuporous, semi-conscious, or even unconscious state during the last few days. Maybe semi-conscious or drowsy, sort of, during the last few weeks. When asked if she could have, unassisted, gotten up from her bed and walked to the couch to watch TV, Dr. Nadison replied, Totally impossible. On November 9, 2007, a search warrant was executed at the house in Hawk's Nest. Police found and seized a large quantity of prescriptions and prescription medication during the search. Shortly after Shelley's death, Blake and Sharon skipped town and went on the run. They did not attend the funeral organized for their daughter by family members. In fact, only six people attended Shelley's funeral. On November 15th, arrest warrants were issued for 46-year-old Blakely Ward and 37-year-old Sharon Ward. Both were to be charged with murder. Detectives believed Blake and Sharon may be traveling in a red 1990 Holden Calais. When Blake and Sharon were ultimately apprehended about 400 kilometers or 250 miles away at a train station in Port Kembla, they were found to be carrying more than 4,000 Australian dollars in cash. At the time of their arrests, Blake immediately flipped on Sharon, saying, It was her, all her fault. After Shelley died, Community Services Minister Kevin Green said he was distressed that a child had died. Amidst some calls for his resignation, Mr. Green said, I won't be resigning. I will be working with the department to improve the processes we have in place. This case is likely to be complex, and for that reason, it would be impossible to draw any conclusions until it has been comprehensively investigated. Our child protection system is not perfect. No system in the world can prevent children from dying in every circumstance. And while we now identify and respond to more reports of abuse and neglect than ever before, on the face of it, the system has let this child down. None of us can ignore that. A few weeks after Shelley's death, an eight-page police statement of facts was submitted to Wollongong local court detailing Shelley's slow and torturous death, which they believed took place over the course of approximately 20 months. The document revealed heretofore unknown details of the little girl's alleged imprisonment and murder, details that sent shockwaves of horror across the country. The document alleged that Sharon and Blakely Ward deliberately ignored every attempt at intervention or assistance by various government agencies in NSW. The forensic pathologist who conducted Shelley's autopsy told police the little girl's body was dehydrated and emaciated, with her muscles wasted away and no subcutaneous fat. Her eyeballs were shriveled and sunken, her ribs protruded, and rigor mortis was absent due to severely wasted muscles. Dr. Kasanathan Nadison concluded that the death is very likely due to chronic malnutrition and neglect. The physical state of Shelley Ward, as described by the forensic pathologist, clearly contradicts the versions supplied by the child's parents. Their evidence of the child being well-nourished and cared for is clearly untruthful. When Shelley died, police said, the room had little affects and was littered with feces. The girl was wearing some items of bed clothing and three pairs of socks, which had been on for an extended period of time, causing her skin to waste away. Her body was fouled with stale urine. Blakely Ward, the document stated, told police Sharon had checked on Shelley at about 6.30 a.m., after which he noticed his wife's behavior was irrational, causing him to ask repeatedly what was wrong. However, at no time during the course of the morning did Blake himself check on his daughter. 
Blakely Ward states he was predominantly occupied with the Saturday Racing Form Guide. Despite Sharon Ward's behavior and despite Blakely Ward's assumption that the child was dead, he did not check on the welfare of Shelley. Medical assistance was not summonsed until 1 p.m. that afternoon. As for the parents' claims that Shelley was alive and well the night before, eating, drinking, and watching TV with the family, police felt their evidence of the child being well-nourished and cared for is clearly untruthful. At the time of her death, Shelley Ward was isolated from all forms of assistance and care and was a prisoner inside her bedroom. Her death was clearly caused through the omission of basic care, nourishment, and medical attention, and with foresight, it was clearly probable that such omissions would result in her death. At the same court hearing, Magistrate Paul Johnson formally refused bail, although the wards did not apply for it. Their next court date was scheduled to take place in early 2008 in Newcastle Local Court. After Blake and Sharon were charged in Shelley's death, a victim protection law unique to NSW kicked in thereby preventing her identification. Her name would henceforth not be used in any publication originating in New South Wales, nor would her picture be shown. Even further, her parents' names and faces would also be masked in order to prevent the victim's identification. As I said in the last episode, however, I think it's time Shelley got her name back, so I am referring to her by name throughout the episode. The joint trial of 46-year-old Blakely Ward and 37-year-old Sharon Ward began in May of 2009 in East Maitland Supreme Court before Judge Robert Hume. During the trial, Crown Prosecutor Peter Barnett attempted to prove that both parents shared equal blame in Shelley's death and that both intentionally caused her death. In his opening arguments, Mr. Barnett warned the jury that the evidence would be highly disturbing, evocative of images of children in the Third World or Holocaust victims. Mr. Barnett described Shelley's condition when she was found as in a state of extreme neglect, wasted and emaciated, black vomit and bull ants coming from her mouth. The face was distorted due to muscle wasting, and there was no fat under the skin. The urine smell persisted even after the body was washed with cleaning agents. Sitting beside her husband, Sharon wept as she heard the Crown describe her daughter's physical state and death. The Crown called multiple witnesses from the Hawk's Nest area who were aware that the Ward family had moved into the area. All of the witnesses testified to seeing Blake and Sharon, but not a single person reported ever seeing Shelley. A TV technician testified that he was called to the home after the family moved in, at which time he said the door to what he believed was Shelley's bedroom was closed, and a rope connected her doorknob to that of another door, preventing anyone inside from opening the door. Evidence was introduced at trial that included a large number of family photos that had been seized by police after Shelley's death. In earlier photos, including one taken during a family holiday in December of 2004, Shelley was pictured, appearing well-nourished. However, in photos taken from approximately July 2006 forward, Shelley was not pictured, even in photos taken during birthdays, Christmases, and other family celebrations. Blake's defense barrister, Mark Austin, defended his client by blaming Blake's out-of-control Valium addiction. By the time of Shelley's death, Mr. Austin told the court, Blake was using 25 tablets of Valium per day, which was the worst case of benzodiazepine addiction the man's doctor had ever encountered. In the weeks leading up to Shelley's death, Blake was constantly in a Valium-induced stupor. Mr. Austin asked, At Hawk's Nest, did you have any concerns in relation to Shelley? Blake replied, No. Mr. Austin asked, Were you concerned about anything at Hawk's Nest? Blake's response was, Tablets. Getting more. As for his daughter, Blake admitted, he only laid eyes on her two times in her final nine weeks. Sharon, Blake's defense insisted, was really to blame. Blake was innocent because he didn't know anything. He was in charge of caring for the two older girls while Shelley was exclusively Sharon's domain. Starting around 2006, Blake said, Shelley wouldn't go near him to wash her, feed her, or anything else. He also told the court that when Sharon found Shelley's body, she told him, We have to get rid of the body. Blake said his response was, That's criminal. That's like we did something. According to Blake, Sharon shot back, If you don't get rid of the body, I'm going back to bed. Which, he said, was exactly what happened. On the opposing side, Sharon's attorney, Dennis Stewart, denied his client's responsibility on the grounds that she was a battered wife merely taking orders from her controlling, violent husband. 
Allegations were made that in addition to being physically abusive, Blake also pimped his wife out, dressing her in schoolgirl outfits and forcing her to participate in sadomasochistic sex acts with paying clients. Sharon testified that she had left Blake twice, returning after he called her and claimed he had ingested a drug overdose. I felt so low all the time, with Blake being so unpredictably violent all the time. He'd wait for a chance to start trouble. He threw me around the room, pulled my hair and kicked me, even before we were married. Other witnesses backed up some of Sharon's claims of abuse and coercive control. Some said the whole family was terrified of Blake, and shopkeepers testified about overhearing Blake demand Sharon put back the groceries she'd selected. A neighbor testified to hearing Blake rebuking Sharon about Shelley's health by snapping at her, She's not well. What kind of a fucking cunt of a mother are you? Another element of Sharon's defense was to deny the facts, despite the apparent impossibility of doing so. Yes, she alone cared for Shelley, but Shelley wasn't starved, she was just sick. The night before she died, Sharon said, she had a huge supper of mush consisting of wheat bix, muesli, rice, and vegetables, which she mixed together and heated in the microwave for Shelley to eat. Her daughter, she claimed, had the stomach flu, so she ended up vomiting the mush all over the living room floor. Sharon said she led Shelley to her bedroom by the hand. Prosecutor Barnett, fortunately, tore her claims apart on cross-examination. In Shelley's condition, he reminded the woman, she would have been comatose by that time, and even so, she had no musculature left whatsoever to support walking, eating, or even sitting up. At last, Prosecutor Barnett got Sharon to admit on the stand that she simply didn't feed Shelley enough. Hadn't eaten enough to feed a mouse, correct? Sharon's defense collapsed around her, and she agreed, Yes, not enough to feed a mouse. An expert witness, forensic psychiatrist Olav Nielsen, testified that Sharon showed no sadness or anger over her daughter's death, instead describing the details in a flat, bland affect. He said that although she had no mental illness he could discern, her lack of emotion regarding trauma was highly abnormal. Saying she either lacked empathy or had suffered long-standing physical or emotional abuse, the psychiatrist posited that Sharon's restricted emotional range could be due to battered wife syndrome although he could not say so with certainty. Pediatric gastroenterologist Dr. Edward O'Laughlin testified that for Shelley's body to have reached the severe state of malnutrition she died in would have taken some time. She was very severely wasted. I would have said that would have taken weeks, as a minimum, to get into that state. Shelley's brain demonstrated atrophy, the doctor testified, saying the brain was the top hierarchy of the body and as such, it would be the very last thing that gets affected by malnutrition and starvation. For her brain to reach that condition would have taken quite some time. The lack of food in Shelley's gastrointestinal tract, Dr. O'Laughlin said, indicated that the little girl had not eaten solid food in many hours or even days. In her bowel, he found a small amount of solid fecal matter, which he referred to as starvation stools, saying they had been there for a long time indicating lack of solid food intake for several days or even weeks. Shelley was, he testified, the most malnourished child he had ever seen. I have never looked after somebody who was so malnourished, and I have seen pictures in textbooks and Holocaust reports and so forth where malnutrition was that severe. She was really one of the most profoundly malnourished images or persons that I have seen. Sharon's defense attorney asked her on the stand, Do you feel responsibility for her death? Had Sharon accepted responsibility, she may have been convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter instead of murder, but she did not, at least not entirely. Her response was, Mostly yes. Regarding Shelley's declining physical condition, Sharon said, I just didn't see it. The drugs, she said, made her feel like I was in a dreamlike state, like I wasn't there. They slowed me down. In his closing argument, defense attorney Stewart said Sharon's drug use made her negligent, foolish, reprehensible, but not guilty of murder. Fortunately, the jury disagreed. On June 23, 2009, Blakely Ward was convicted of manslaughter, while Sharon Ward was found guilty of the murder of seven-year-old Shelley Ward. Both Sharon and Blake were sentenced on October 2, 2009. As the pathetic pair sat on opposite ends of the dock, not making eye contact or showing any emotion, Judge Robert Hume tore the couple several new orifices as he handed down his judgment, condemning Blake and Sharon as so absorbed in their own lives that they did not care for their own daughter. By the time Shelley was a skin-covered skeleton, the judge thundered, 
they kept her out of family photos and out of their sight altogether. Their behavior toward Shelley was unimaginably heartless and cruel. The photographs he had seen of Shelley, the judge declared, were the most horrific images of a deceased child imaginable. Viewing those photographs was the only way to understand the full horror of Shelley's death and the desperate state she was in for some time leading up to it. During the last day of Shelley's life, when her condition must have been glaringly evident, Sharon could have saved her daughter by calling for help, but instead she chose not to lift a finger to help her. For a person to do nothing in those circumstances is so morally reprehensible that it could be no more serious if the person intended that the child die. Sharon's crime, the judge proclaimed, was in the worst category of murder. Her daughter, at age seven, was more vulnerable than other people her age due to her diagnosed medical issues and history. Both parents failed to seek assistance for Shelley's medical, developmental, and educational needs due to their own incompetence, negligence, self-interest, and disinterest. They denied her necessary medical care, not to mention stimulation and simple childhood pleasures, keeping her a prisoner in her own bedroom for extended periods of time. Her filthy bedroom, the judge said, doubled as her toilet. Both parents were aware of the squalid conditions in which they confined their daughter, and there was no way they could have been unaware of the horrific smells coming from Shelley's bedroom. Blake's testimony that he breathed through his mouth and therefore smelled nothing, the judge said, was palpable nonsense. Of Blake, the judge gave the conclusion, in a gross abrogation of his parental responsibility, Blake simply ignored Shelley. He knew that she was thin and unwell at the time of the move to Hawksnest, and yet he displayed no interest in her whatsoever. He realized that she was being confined to her bedroom. Even when locked in that room, the distress that she was in, that Dr. O'Loughlin spoke of, would have been audible. Blake could not have cared less. A father could show no less love to his child. The abject cruelty that had become her existence was of no concern to him. Rather than being something that might reduce his moral culpability, Blake's preference to absorb himself in his abuse of prescription medications and his punting and other personal activities was further indication of his self-interest and lack of concern. Blake's abuse of prescription medication provides no excuse for him and does not reduce his moral culpability. Even Blake's excessive drug use, the judge opined, would have no effect on his ability to understand what was happening to his daughter and intervene, which was demonstrated by the fact that Blake could carry on many normal life functions, such as driving, shopping, paying his bills, studying the betting guide, internet gambling, and trading on eBay. The judge said that Blake's crime was within the worst-case category for the crime of manslaughter, adding, To establish an offense of manslaughter by criminal negligence, it must be proved that the negligence of the offender merits criminal punishment, because it fell so far short of the standard of care that a reasonable person would have exercised in the circumstances. It involves such a high risk that death or really serious bodily harm would follow, and the degree of negligence is so serious that it should be treated as criminal conduct. In this case, there was a high risk of death, not just a really serious bodily harm. The difference between the standard of care that a reasonable person would have exercised and that which Blake exercised was vast. He provided no care at all, and he did not care. It must be borne in mind that Blake's negligence involved Shelley experiencing an extended period of suffering preceding her death. With that, Judge Hume sentenced Sharon Ward to life in prison without parole and Blakely Ward to 16 years imprisonment with a non-parole period of 12 years. After the trial, Judge Hume ruled that the little girl, who was the subject of the most profound neglect and abandonment, deserved a name, allowing her to be identified only as Ebony, which was Shelley's middle name. In my view, having regard to this evidence, there is a considerable interest in this poor little girl having some identity assigned to her. She should not simply be some anonymous person and should have a name. To my mind, maintaining her anonymity would perpetuate the abandonment. The NSW state government announced not long after Shelley's death that former Supreme Court Judge James Wood QC would head a ministerial child protection commission with the hopes of improving the care of vulnerable children. Community Services Minister Kevin Green said of the inquiry, We are determined to continue the process of reform moving forward. There is no doubt that recent events have highlighted to me the need to take this process forward. The commission will look at issues such as how we fill the caseworker positions, how we can cut red tape and get our caseworkers out from behind desks and into the field, 
how we can provide better help to kids we think need to be removed from their home, and how we provide better support to our field staff. The Special Commission of Inquiry into Child Protection Services in New South Wales, widely known as the Woods Inquiry, was established on November 14, 2007, with the mission of investigating the safety and welfare of all NSW children. After a year-long investigation, during which he found that DOCS was overwhelmed with at-risk reports, while children with serious risk were often undermanaged and overlooked, Justice Wood handed down a report in November of 2008 recommending changes within the child protection system that would cope with future demands. Upon the completion of the Woods Inquiry, the Child and Young Persons Care and Protection Act of 1998 was amended in 2009, and the NSW government developed a five-year comprehensive plan called Keeping Them Safe, a Shared Approach to Child Well-Being, with the goal of reforming NSW's child protection system. In 2009, the New South Wales Ombudsman, Bruce Barber, released a report titled The Death of Ebony, The Need for an Effective Interagency Response to Children at Risk, in which he cited the appalling failure of multiple government agencies that received reports of potential harm to Shelley and her sisters. He cited multiple failures of the Departments of Community Services, Education, Aging Disability and Home Care, Housing, and the NSW Police Force. My investigation shows these agencies did not work together effectively when dealing with Ebony's family. This lack of coordination meant vital information was not shared and warning signs went unnoticed. This, in turn, led to missed opportunities for appropriate intervention to ensure the safety and well-being of Ebony and her siblings. This is one case where if government agencies had acted properly, I have absolutely no doubt that this little girl would still be alive. The report also revealed that in 2008 alone, 115 NSW children died whose situations had been reported to DOCS within the three years prior. I read through the entire 66-page document, which was as thorough and detailed as I could ever have hoped, and it left me reeling at the depth of the failure of the systems in place to protect Australian children. Of course, that feeling is nothing new to me. I feel the same way every time an American government agency fails a child or any such agency in any country for that matter. I think it's incredibly important to stress, however, that in most cases, the problems are not at the individual employee level. The catastrophic issues are, for the most part, systemic. I'll acknowledge that I do speak negatively about child protective agencies on a regular basis, but please don't misunderstand. I think highly of anyone who goes into such a profession and works hard to help vulnerable children. It's the policies and procedures and red tape of the agencies themselves that most often lead to, for example, a caseworker's hands being tied or an employee's caseload being far too heavy. In a case like Shelley's, it's impossible not to place some of the blame at the feet of these agencies. While the fault may not lie with any individual within, a variety of systemic factors converged to create what was unfortunately the perfect environment in which a little girl who needed help more than most was able to slip through the cracks and literally be forgotten, to waste away to little more than a skeleton in a room piled with her own feces. Between 2005 and 2007, the DOCS alone received 17 reports about the Ward family, from domestic violence to the state of their home to their children's absence from school to Shelley's treatment. In the two years before she died, even though she was at a heightened risk for harm, Shelley was not seen by a single person working for any government agency. What happened to Shelley was tragic to begin with, but even more so because it was absolutely preventable. There were countless opportunities for someone to step in and prevent this tragedy, but for any number of reasons at any given time, despite the dire warnings of people who cared about this little girl, none of those opportunities were seized and Shelley died in misery and agony and solitude after multiple reports were closed due to competing priorities amongst the cases of families requiring attention. By the time the ward's case file was transferred to an office closer to their new home, and Shelley's situation was escalated to a case of extreme risk, the little autistic girl died just four days later without a caseworker even being assigned. Mr. Barber's report stated, this is, without a doubt, the most concerning case I've seen in my time as ombudsman. This death was preventable. Of the recommendations based on the Woods Inquiry, Mr. Barber wrote, The current reforms carry with them risks and challenges. A more coordinated response to families at risk, effective information sharing, and a changing culture are crucial, and without them the new system will not work. We will be watching closely to make sure these vital changes take place. 
The Sydney Morning Herald wrote of the handling of Shelley's case. Things seem clearer with hindsight, but it's clear foresight and common sense could have saved Shelley's life. The newspaper was more than willing to point a finger directly at one DOCS employee in particular, which I found interesting, so I'm going to quote the passage from their 2009 article. Shelley's case has been extensively detailed, but it is instructive to focus on the unidentified child protection worker who was asked in April 2007 to visit the home, interview the parents, ascertain the children's whereabouts, cite the children, and interview them if possible. If necessary, a search warrant was to be obtained. By this stage, DOCS had been involved, to varying degrees, with the family since long before Shelley was even born. At the time DOCS sent a staff member to Shelley's family home in April 2007, they had been told by the housing department that the house was filthy, and by the education department that none of the children were attending school. Shelley had never been to school. This alone should have alerted the senses of the DOCS worker. For good measure, this person was told by a housing development staff member that the father was evasive and would not allow her to cite the children, and she was concerned the children may be being kept locked in bedrooms. The alarm bells of anyone with a shred of common sense and commitment would have been ringing by now. The DOCS officer went to the house, but no one was home. When she went back three days later, she bumped into the father as he arrived home. There was some argy-bargy about what was happening with the children, and the officer was fobbed off with stories about their pending medical appointments. A week later, the DOCS worker and a colleague went back to the house where they cited the two older girls. Those girls said Shelley was next door. The father said she was asleep in her room. More than a week earlier, this worker was told in no uncertain terms to cite the children and speak to them, but Shelley was completely overlooked. If you were sent to check on a child who had never been to school, lived in a filthy house with weird parents suspected of locking their kids in their rooms, wouldn't you absolutely insist on seeing that child? Wouldn't you go into the bedroom where she was allegedly sleeping? Wouldn't you pop next door to the neighbors where she was allegedly visiting? Of course you would. All the red tape under the sun will not help kids if frontline child protection workers simply ignore the rules as they did with Shelley. And new rules and regulations are no substitute for common sense, a vital skill sorely lacking in this tragic saga. This was a dreadful, obvious case of child abuse. All the signs were there. If DOCS couldn't get this one right, what hope is there for kids on the borderline? There has to be a case for the worker's education to be regarded as less important than common sense, determination, and life experience. In 2011, Blake appealed his sentence on three grounds. The first was that Judge Hume erred in finding that Shelley was the subject of chronic starvation over a period of many months. The second was that the judge erred in finding that Blake's conduct fell within the worst category of the crime of manslaughter. The third was that the sentence imposed was manifestly excessive. His appeal was dismissed on all three grounds. In 2012, Sharon appealed both her conviction and her sentence. The basis of her grounds for appealing her conviction was, to put it succinctly, that the judge failed to instruct the jury properly on several points, but that appeal was denied. However, Justices Peter Hall and David Davies wrote in their judgment, In our opinion, it cannot be said that the present case is within the worst case category, nor that the level of culpability was so extreme that the community interest can only be met by the imposition of a life sentence. Justice Peter McClellan disagreed, writing that he wasn't convinced Judge Hume's decision was wrong or that the sentence is manifestly excessive. Although the conviction appeal was denied, Sharon's life sentence was quashed and in 2013, she was resentenced to serve 30 years without parole, a period that expires on November 16, 2037, plus an additional term of 10 years which will expire on November 16, 2047, when she is 73 years old. In 2016, the Sydney Morning Herald reported that Chris and Deborah Alexiou, the owners of the rental home in Hawk's Nest where Shelley took her last breath, sold the home that they once considered their nest egg, located just meters from Port Stephens and its white sandy beaches. The Alexius said they trusted the Department of Housing, which recommended the Ward family as tenants. They had no idea the family was running to escape the scrutiny of various government agencies on suspicion of severe child neglect. Mrs. Alexiou told the Herald, I still can't get out of my head the fact that she was in there and we did not know, that these government departments stuffed up and that she was in our house and no one knew. 
That is something that I have to live with. I keep coming back to that. The couple was financially and emotionally devastated by the fallout of Shelley's death. Mrs. Alexiou said, The last eight years have just been a nightmare. It has changed our life dramatically. What we have gone through, I don't think anyone should have to go through. Emotionally, financially, physically, mentally, it has changed our lives forever. We did nothing wrong. These two monsters came in and killed their child in there. The mother was initially given a life sentence and that was trimmed back. He wasn't. The only people given a life sentence was ourselves and little Ebony. When asked if they had any advice for homeowners trying to rent, she said, If someone comes from Housing Commission and they've been recommended by the government, then run. Because if something falls apart, it falls apart in a big way. And the government will not support you. They will hang you out to dry. While awaiting the sale of the house, Mrs. Alexiou took four flowers to a beach in Sydney, one for each of her family members and one for Shelley, and placed them in the water before walking further down the beach. At that point, she received a phone call. I was looking out to sea, and Chris rang to say it had gone through, and I just looked down and one of the flowers hit me in the foot. Just one of them, and I knew she was telling me something, like she was saying goodbye. It was one of the most emotional things that has happened in my life. There are some things you just can't explain. I just burst into tears, and I cried uncontrollably for ten minutes. In 2019, Blake Ward, by that time 58, applied for parole at his earliest possible release date after serving 12 of his 16 years behind bars. The Serious Offenders Review Council an independent body managing the cases of the worst criminals in the state, determined that releasing Blake on parole would be inappropriate despite the trial judge in 2009 saying he was unlikely to re-offend. After a private hearing, the NSW State Parole Authority denied Blake's application for parole. In her brilliant article in The Monthly, Anne Mann ended with four paragraphs so powerful and articulate that I want to read them to you in their entirety. I couldn't possibly sum up what happened to Shelley in any starker or more eloquent words. From her article, simply titled, Ebony. Early photos show Shelley plump and pretty in a little dress, smiling radiantly. But over time, Shelley becomes the scapegoat, the receptacle, the dumping ground for all the despair and rage of this toxic family. As Shelley is progressively dehumanized, it becomes more and more possible to do yet worse things to her. What she becomes, as a result of her abuse, is a further invitation to cruelty. She is gradually, step by step, being excluded from the human community and its most intimate representative, her family. The parents gradually reduce her to living in a non-human state. I will not say animal-like state for so many of those who share the lives of animals treat them with infinitely greater tenderness than this little child was shown, feed them good food, sleep with them, caress them, pay thousands of dollars in vet bills, mourn them when they die. Around 2005, the mother decides Shelley is not worth schooling. She rebuffs the special school teachers eager to take her. Shelley can't learn, can't speak, is disruptive and difficult. No point. She becomes ever more difficult, She screams at the sight of water, so she is washed with a flannel, then not at all. She slips into the category of not worth washing. Then she pisses in her clothes and is not worth dressing. She is five, six, and seven years old, but wears nappies. In that state, she is not worth photographing, so she disappears from the family album. Her birthday is held in her absence. Her existence is quietly being erased. Then she is not worth changing. The nappies are left off, and she pisses and shits all over her room. Now the room stinks, and she is not worth visiting. She is characterized as a wild creature in need of more caging, so the door is tied shut. Locked up, she screams and screams the two words she has left, Mommy and Daddy. The room is so foul no one, not even the mother, wants to go in there. Shelley is given less and less food and water. She becomes weaker and weaker. She is now unable to sit or speak, lies lifeless. She has become thing-like, fading out of existence in that room that the father can't bear to go into. She has become the fulfillment of their treatment of her. But when Shelley dies, as they confront the brute reality of her corpse, they can no longer live in the state of denial of what it is they have been doing. The father dials triple zero. He first fumbles for the words, and then he finds them. He tells the operator that his daughter is dead. One of the most frequent types of comments I see on my various social media posts and elsewhere 
is an expression of profound disbelief and the person's inability to comprehend how such cruelty, especially to an innocent child, is possible, and that is more than valid. No matter how many of these cases I cover, I don't think I'll ever understand it. There's no part of me that could ever possibly condone this kind of treatment of a child, of course. But the way Ms. Mann worded those four paragraphs comes as close as I think I've ever come to following the twisted logic of any of these long-time abusive parents. I may never understand why a parent could treat a child this way, but I can at least see how the ward's treatment of their autistic little girl devolved from bad to unthinkable to utterly inhumane. What matters more than anything, though, is not the thought process of Blakely and Sharon Ward, who continue to waste breath in Australian prisons to this day. What matters is never allowing the name Shelley Ebony Ward to be forgotten, never allowing Shelley's glowing face and sweet smile to fade, and, in her memory and that of countless other children who have met a similar fate, never giving up on a child who needs help, because our intervention might be the only thing that could keep the next child alive. Shelley didn't have to die. Even with her various diagnoses, she could have thrived and lived a long, meaningful life. If she was alive right now, Shelley Ebony Ward would be 21 years old. My sources for this episode were Find a Grave, a 2009 report by NSW Ombudsman Bruce Barber titled The Death of Ebony, The Need for an Effective Interagency Response to Children at Risk, an article in The Monthly by Anne Mann titled Ebony, The Daily Telegraph, The Sydney Morning Herald, News.com.au, New South Wales Case Law, Criminal Justice on iResearchNet, ABC News Australia, The Newcastle Herald, Web Sleuths, an article titled Guilty Until Proven Innocent, The Assumption of Care of a Baby at Birth by Christine A. Marsh, Jenny Brown, Jan Taylor, and Deborah Davis, childwelfare.gov, and court documents. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.